Um, we're going to start. I'm Alan. Hi, I'm Pat. Uh, and we are here to talk about um, mobile gaming and some research that we've done on mobile gaming that we are happy to be able to share with the wider world. First, some background. Um, uh, hi, I'm a PhD candidate at UC Santa Cruz in cognitive psychology. Uh, this summer, I interned with Google Ads um, on the consumer-facing side, um, and now I have a job at Google for the fall, um, pending my PhD. So pray for me, friends. <laughs> um, I'm a UX researcher at Google as well. The research I'm going to be talking about today, my portion of this talk, is from work I did when I was with the Play team. That's the Android App Store. Um, and I never finished my PhD, and I am both proud and better about that. <laughs> Okay, so I want us to start by imagining this scenario. We are in a meeting with some sort of high-level exec, and they ask, hey, Vroom, how do gamers feel about in-game ads? These are some things that you might hear from people in the room. That, oh, ads are actually not effective, players just ignore them, or players really don't like them, but they understand that they are sometimes necessary, they're just kind of part of the landscape we have today. Or that, maybe it depends on what kind of player you are. Some players, the more hardcore players, hate them, but casual players are totally okay with them. Um, as a UXR, we would say, well, it depends on, and actually that's what we're going to talk about today is what it depends on. Um, but this idea that like, it depends is probably something we find ourselves saying a lot as researchers because we want to talk about nuance, right? Like We have this thing we value, which is understanding the relationship between things in a more detailed way. So, we are going to talk about the relationship today between players' motivations and their previous experience with the game, and how these things actually help you understand uh, acceptance or tolerance of ads. Does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's just what I said. Um, and then, uh, we are going to hopefully give you guys some strategies for deploying ads in your mobile games, uh, based on the research that Pat did last summer. All right, first we're gonna start talking about why do people play mobile games in general? Um, so the way this research started for me is I joined this team at Google, uh, my first time really focusing on mobile players um, as a population of interest. And um, I saw that my team and a lot of my stakeholders had this folk schema, hardcore or casual, and that everybody in the world and every game in the world could be binned into one of these two buckets. And what comes along with this kind of folk segmentation is the idea that hardcore players always play to win, whereas casual players only play to pass the time. Hardcore players will only spend to win, or that's the main driving force, is you know, dominating their opponents. And money helps them dominate, so they're gonna spend money. Or uh, that if you're a casual player, you just don't spend at all, because casuals just don't spend. Um, but hardcore players were ultra competitive and very social, and again, they limited themselves to certain games, whereas casual players were typically quiet and isolated and only played a, a distinct type of games from the hardcore players. So this was, this was kind of like the mind space and the, the shared conceptual understanding um, that existed on my team. Um, also that comes along with this is some demographic assumptions. So the hardcore players are usually going to be younger, and they're going to be men, and they're probably going to own this gamer identity. Like if I had a coin for every, not a coin, if I had a dollar for every time someone asked me, hey, are you a gamer? And I'd be like, uh, I don't know. Do you play games? Yes. Um, this idea that the more hardcore, or the hardcore players will own up this identity, whereas casual players would not. So um, realized there was a big gap here, and that especially since Google Play is on so many different devices and used by people all over the world, um, that, that Android as a gaming platform is this thing that's used all over the world. We had to dive deeper to get a better understanding of the similarities and differences um, between different types of players. So we did this thing called the mobile player segmentation, uh, which is what I'm gonna talk about for the next few slides at a really high level. By the way, has anyone seen these little illustrations before? They look like Android guys, right? Um, I actually, there was a Medium post that goes over a lot of the same stuff that came out, I don't know, last year sometime. Um, but if you've read that Medium post, then you already know everything I'm gonna say. So um, 
wait until Pat's section at the top, because what she's saying is new stuff. <laughs> All right, so the, the world that I arrived in was one where we had done some market segmentation research in three regions, the APAC regions, um, and we were just kicking off some new work um, in these western regions. Um, so this is cool. This means that we had an understanding at a country level. Uh, here are some important different categories of players. Here's some uh, important differences in their play behavior and discovery behavior and other things that we care about as a platform. And in total, we had about 22,000 responses from across all these segmentations. But my challenge, or one of my challenges, was that I was on a central team that made decisions globally. So my team wasn't focused just on how do we change the Play Store for the US, or how do we change the Play Store just for um, Taiwan. Uh, but rather, I had to try to take like a worldwide view and help the team come up with some useful way of understanding mobile players across these countries, not just within a certain country. Um, another thing that I had to wrestle with was this idea of like, well, if you're doing this global segmentation, does that mean that these other segments are useless? And so there's this analogy that I've deployed a lot internally in talking about this, that um, there's different levels of resolution you get, the more specific you get in the, um, in kind of like your locus of inquiry. So the idea of the global segments, the goal here is to provide a, a worldwide understanding for central decision making, the country specific segments, um, this, uh, are still being used at the per country level. And then finally, all of this should be working together with much more detailed market uh, initiative and product specific research than, than traditional UX. Okay, so another challenge we had is that the APAC surveys all were designed differently than our uniform set of Western surveys. So what we did is we actually went through all the survey data and we bucketed it into these two meta dimensions, uh, social behavior and passion for gaming. So social behavior, what does that mean and how we're thinking about it for this global segmentation? Um, so it's not just about your behavior in the platform um, or the things you say you do in a game. Uh, it's also about the, the things that you would say in a survey about how you relate to other people or how, other, how important other people are in your game behavior. So an example might be, I learned about new games from my friends playing the game. That kind of survey statement, if I score that highly, that tells me that the sociality is an important aspect of your mobile gameplay experience. Um, whereas, next, passion is this, this bucket, this meta dimension of talking about all the different ways that you say, yes, mobile gaming is important to me. Um, so, for example, if I'm really driven by doing something that may be considered social, but for this ultimate, like, I just want to really dive into the game and be the best, that speaks to a passion for gaming. Um, so people who scored um, strongly on these kinds of statements would be categorized as being more, or having a strong passion component to their gameplay. Um, so we worked with a, an agency called Skim to do a lot of the hard math with us. Um, we took all the survey responses, we coded the appropriate ones into the social and passion meta dimensions, and then we actually changed, uh, unified the scaling um, from the different surveys so we could use the survey data from all these different countries together, even though they weren't actually the same survey design. Um, and at the end of the day, we arrived with this, which is our five segment global overview of who plays mobile games. And I'm gonna be talking about some of the interesting things that we just covered in the segmentation. So, for example, um, there is no gender landslide in any of these segments. You can see that the tentative followers have about 11% delta, but that's the largest. And so picked at random from the world, gender does not help you predict what gaming segment someone belongs in, okay? Um, it's independent of gender. Uh, another thing that stood out to us is the age range. Um, as we get to um, these segments that have less time on average playing, there is a, um, more commonly we see older players being classified that way, but it's not a landslide. And the most common or the mode age group for each one of these segments is still this 
this kind of 26 to 45 broad bucket. We also were able to look at some of the different ways that people's motivation statements lined up between these different groups. So for example, the connected enthusiasts, and on, the, on my graph here, you can see there at the top right, the blue guys. Um, they would over-index, or they, they over-index on progression skill, um, especially in social tests of skill. This makes sense, they're highly social. Uh, beating other people or playing with other people is a key part of why they play games. Compared to pre, uh, playful explorers and influence players, so you can see that they score lower on the social um, axis, but are still uh, more passionate than, uh, than the last two segments we're gonna talk about. Um, have this, still have this really strong drive to, to, to progress, to continue progressing. Whereas tentative followers and passive players are the most likely to say that uh, mobile gaming is something they do to fill the time or to relieve boredom. Now something that um, has helped me think about this is that boredom is actually a form of stress. And so if I have a situation where I'm about to be bored and I want to avoid being bored, mobile games are this great way for me to stave off the boredom by playing something that I have at hand. Also, what does this mean for spending? Well, um, parented enthusiasts are the most like this kind of um, folk idea of a hardcore player in that they're paying a lot to make progress and to compete or to help out their team, so there's a strong social component and a strong I just want to win component. Um, whereas one of the really interesting things about the playful explorers and influence players is that um, they spend, a part, of, part of spend in this segment is to maintain a sense of control. So it's not just important that I continue to progress, but it's important for me to feel like that progression is regular. And if I get stuck on something, it's okay spending a little bit to get unstuck so I can continue that regularity of feeling like I have control in this game. And then finally, our, our tentative followers and passive players are the most likely to say, I don't want to spend a mobile games, period. It's just not that important to me. It's really, really low on my hierarchy of things I care about. You may also be thinking to yourself, well, if there's three things up there, Alan, and you said there was five segments, why are, why are you going to collapse everything into three chunks? Part of it is because there, there are more nuanced intersegment differences that we just, for business reasons, haven't shared. But this is like a high-level summary of the differences between the segments. Um, this is something that was really interesting, is we uh, took all the self-reported genre play data and combined it. So you can see here that um, basically across, you've got the genre and the percentage of people from that segment that self-reported playing that genre. And then going down, you've got the different genres. Um, so one of the things that really stands out here is that there are some genres that everybody plays. So if you want to make a mobile game that's going to appeal to everyone, it should be a puzzle game, basically. That's one takeaway from this. Uh, same for card games. Uh, another interesting thing about this is that no particular genre defines a segment. So you really shouldn't be working backwards from, oh, this game is hardcore, therefore only hardcore players will play it. In fact, what we see actually is that more passionate players are omnivorous. So they just play more of everything. And one of the um, consequences of this is because they play more, um, they're playing games usually with more complicated mechanics. They're kind of scaffolding the, the kinds of things they can look for in a game compared to a less passionate player. So they can like, recognize value in more games than uh, less passionate players. And this gives them um, basically a more sophisticated, under, or more sophisticated model in their head of what do I want to play? What is this game going to be like? What is also, what is okay to spend on? And when is an ad okay? And this is where we start transitioning into the stuff that Pat's going to talk about, uh, ad uh, acceptance. So there's this idea of playing schema. Um, like I said, it's a player's understanding of the game mechanics systems and exchanges. And um, again, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that more passionate players, because they're playing a wider breadth of games, and have broader experience to draw from, draw from are gonna have more nuanced ways of thinking about what is worth my time, what's worth my money, um, you know, what is acceptable to me in my gameplay choices. Um, I actually think this is where I hand off yeah, to Patch. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna start with the 
So, um, generally, how do we understand what a player is thinking about when an oh, and when an ad is worth it in the game? How many of you like play mobile games? How many of you hate ads in them? I do. I do. So this was a personally relevant uh, research project when I was an intern at Google. And the general research question was, what are the delights and pain points um, that people have when interacting with ads in mobile games? And specifically, do individuals' gameplay motivational clusters, their personal motivations and passions, actually affect their ad tolerance? Um, in order to answer this, I did a three-part study. Um, the first study I'm not going to talk about too much today, but it was uh, really it was really to contextualize and validate the connection between gaming motivation, gaming motivational clusters as used by uh, Nikki at Quantic Foundry, actually, um, and ad attitudes. And the ones that I'm going to be talking about today are the survey and the, uh, the mobile playthrough and ad uh, review. But ultimately, my question was kind of, what predicts mobile game ad tolerance? Um, so the key finding that I have, in case you all fall asleep before the end of my, of my talk, um, is that game-dependent game dependent motivations actually mediate uh, ad acceptance. Um, although in general players, uh, when general players play mobile games uh, and they play for different reasons, um, they have different motivations when they're actually playing. So the motivations aren't a fixed personality trait, it's actually an affordance of the game uh, that they're playing and it's very contextual. Um, so specifically, um, can a self-identified, like basically, um, self-identified hardcore or casual players um, even when they're playing different games, they may engage the games according to the affordances of it um, and their histories with that game, so their gaming schema. Um, so in this context, um, ads that may be okay um, in a slower-paced game can actually ruin the flow of a faster-paced game because of their actual expectations based on their own past histories of playing games in general and their own expectations and motivations in that moment. Um, so, what do I mean by in-game ads? I'm sure many of you have seen all of this. A banner ad is like this one that's uh, stuck to the top, it's either um, anchored to the top or the bottom. Um, participants often get really annoyed if it's anchored to the bottom and the buttons are there because they say it feels deceitful to press it um, and like go to a landing screen. And in interstitial, the one in the center is actually one that pops up either, um, it's called pre-roll or post-roll, so it's before the game starts or um, between levels in a game. And then there's rewarded videos, which are actually really well received um, because participants can opt into that and they get a reward either an extra life or some coins or something. Um, so ads that are more annoying versus less annoying. Um, the concept of annoying isn't actually intrinsic to the ad itself. It, there are different things about ad formats, which I'll talk about in a bit, that are frustrating, but um, really annoying it exists in the context of a player's background, motivations, and engagement with the game itself. Players don't play games to interact with ads. They play games to play games, and what they want out of the game determines how they feel about the ad. Um, so players that are more experienced or passionate about the game actually see ads as a way to afford more and deeper engagement. Um, so specifically, um, players often talk about time as money. Um, those who are passionate understand that uh, their experience and engagement determines how worth it ads feel to them. So the more passion they have, the more, uh, the more they're willing to spend their time, literally spend their time um, as a form of uh, currency to exchange uh, for the game. Um, so, passionate players who are more engaged and experienced often interact with the game with regular engagement. They play a lot, they may think about it a lot, they may look stuff up online. Um, and in this way, the game is worth paying for with their time by watching ads, especially if the game is free. Um, for not quite so passionate players um, who are less engaged and experienced, they're actually trying to figure out whether they like the game at all. And the presence of ads is not worth their time. The presence of ads can actually interfere with the way that they perceive the game, interfere with the way that they feel, um, you know. They, people who are learning the game and see ads often will delete the game altogether. Um, so the first thing, one of the first things that I did was a survey. Um, so basically, do casual game players fall into a specific gaming motivational cluster? Or do different gaming platforms afford different motivated styles of play across all different types of players? Um, oh, um, so this is, again, the survey of 237 participants, this was run on MTurk, um, to validate the relationship between gaming motivational clusters, player types, and the affordances of mobile platforms. Basically the question was, like, do hardcore versus casual players think differently or feel differently about mobile games? And if that's the case, should I be looking at these two populations separately um, when looking at the ways that they interact with ads? Um, and what I found was that, um, this is, again, Action Social, Mastery Achievement, Immersion Creativity um, are all from Nikki at the Quantic Foundry's uh, Gaming Motivational Clusters. Um, on the left, oh, I'm not going to go through, you can read. 
Um, on the left, on the left graph, it shows that um, orange is emergent creativity. So for self-identified casual or gamer types, casual gamers, core mid core gamers, and hardcore gamers. Um, for all three of them, immersion in a game or maintaining the game flow was the most important part of playing video games in general across all players. Um, then when I asked them, uh, what do you like about mobile games, console games, or PC games, um, everybody across all three um, self-identified gamer types said that mobile games allow for more mastery achievement style playing, um, and these afforded, uh, and with the games they type, uh, uh, sorry, mobile games allow for more mastery achievement type playing, with uh, the types of games they offer, even across self-identified player types. So when the mobile, um, when the very leftmost cluster of the mobile uh, responses were broken down into self-identified gamer type, um, it was still mastery achievement that came out across all three um, populations. Um, so taking that information and deciding that um, you know people who play motivational play mobile games all have very similar motivational clusters. Um, the question was generally, what is the user's journey when actually playing casual mobile games and interacting with ads? And again, what are the lights and pain points during this experience? And is there a relationship to different ad type and timing combinations? Um, so I'm going to walk you through um, the type of graphs that I'm going to be presenting um, with my data. Um, the data collected here is from uh, the set of seven interviews, the third study. Um, and in terms of how I coded the data, um, I, in my PhD program, I'm studying cognitive linguistics, which means I'm actually trained to um, identify emotional language, metaphorical language, and uh, multimodal cues that expresses emotionality. So it'll make sense when you see the graph. So on the top is the mindset that um, we gave the participants. This is an example set of data, by the way. We'll get to the real one in a sec. And on the top, they have different phases of playing a game. So there's like explore, where you like are choosing the game, you play the game, you win or lose, and you reset, whether you go back and play it or not. On the y-axis, there's emotional valence, where it's negative to positive, um, and this is a qualitative. Uh, this is a qualitative judgment. It's not necessarily on a scale. Um, and then uh, these little dots are the actions that people concretely took in the game, um, and. When I get to my real data, the actions that are represented are actually the mode, the one that people did the most often. Um, and you, as you can see, each action is related to an emotional valence within each phase of the game. So this is kind of an idealized pattern where people navigate to the game, play the game, and win the game. And like I said before, when people play games, they're not doing it to see an ad, but they do have to interact with ads. Um, so wherever there's an ad, it's represented in orange, and that actually brings us to what I call an ad sub journey. So thinking of a critical user journey basically as um, a task flow. When people interact with ads, they have to actually do something with it. And so um, when it's maxed out in orange, it'll be an ad journey. And so again, the top are higher level, or higher level phases where it's a choice. Did the person choose to click on a rewarded video or was it automatic? Um, checking it, like how are they oriented to it? Attending is kind of the part that we're most interested in and asking, like, do they actually click on the ad to go purchase something or not? Um, and again, you can see that um, each of these dots are actions that are related to the emotional valence. With these graphs that I'm going to be showing you, I'd like you to really pay attention to um, more the shape of the graphs as well as the transitions between points where people are doing game actions and ad actions, because those are the most interesting uh, things. Thinking about the interactions between one's actions in the game and one's actions with an ad or how the ad affects that. Um, so I'd like to talk about season versus new players. Um, and these are different types of ads, uh, interstitial video quick to downloads like the one that I showed you before. Um, and again, oh, sorry. Again, this is from uh, the third study where I did an in-lab mobile game playthrough and ad format review um, to better identify this task flow. So for new players, um, when the, for new players, they're trying to learn a game. And so the mindset, is I want to see how I feel about this new game. They don't actually have a pre-existing schema for it. Um, and this participant, so this one is actually a case study. Um, this is one participant out of the seven um, where we actually handed him a game because um, in the playthrough they were asked to play their own games that they were experienced with, but his phone wasn't cooperating. Um, and so this game uh, is called Flood It 2, and it has uh, ads that Google owns. So he navigates the Flood It 2, split fairly neutral, but as you can see, um, once he starts playing the game and exploring how to play, he actually said, I don't really care much for games like these. 
Um, but once he hit the anchored banner um, on the play screen, he, uh, he actually said something along the lines of like, I hate this game, I hate ads. Um, but when he, hit the, when he won the round, he went back to being like, I guess this is all right. But when he hit the interstitial video, he said, this ad just made me not like the game. It's distracting. Do you want me to play your game or do you want me to watch your ad? Um, so the idea here, um, he like immediately after that, he started a new level, started pressing around and just went like, oh, this is the worst. Can I quit? And I was like, yeah, is that what you would do in real life? And he said, yeah, I'd quit and delete this game. And so the idea here is that new game players are often deciding if they can enjoy the game long term. Um, if they're not motivated to play the game, if they don't feel passionate about the game, then ads introduce a reason for them to delete it. Any ad can be too many ads for a player that doesn't think that the game is worth exchanging their time for. Um, their time is too valuable. Um, on the other hand, um, seasoned players, um, oftentimes when they're playing games, they have the mindset, I want to kill time by playing one of my favorite mobile games. Um, and this is their journey, don't freak out. <laughs> so there's kind of a lot to it, but what I really want you to notice is the general shape of it is much more positive, or at least more neutral, um, even when there are anchored banners, um, and even when ads uh, start playing, except for this last part, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, and another thing that uh, was very key in this was for seasoned players, they often do like this feedback loop, where they'll, they'll win a game, lose a game, and they'll press, uh, press replay. Um, but one thing that I want us to look at is when people lose a game and there's an automatically playing interstitial ad, um, the automatically playing interstitial is what the new player also looked at. Um, for the new player, in his ad journey, it was completely negative. But for the seasoned players, it's more neutral. And here's actually what it looks like um, side by side. So seasoned players, um, these are pretty much the same action points. You can see that the valence is completely different. Um, so seasoned players are more neutral. It's not necessarily good, like a lot of people don't necessarily like ads, but it's a lot more neutral than new players who have a completely negative experience. So in this way, new players have a lower tolerance for interstitial videos, interstitial ads, because watching an ad does not feel like an equal exchange of their time yet. Um, but seasoned players, um, yeah, unlike seasoned players, I've already said this, um, new players are trying to decide if this game is worth it, and any ad can be too many ads. It's not worth their exchanging their time for. Um, this brings us back to this idea of passion. So with more passionate players who are regularly engaged, the game is worth paying for with their time. For new players um, who aren't quite so passionate, who are trying to learn the game, um, ads are actually disruptive. They're, they're pulling them out of the game, they're pulling them out of that experience, and it's not worth paying for with their time. Um, so this is a direct quote from one of the participants. Uh, this is one of the motivated, highly passionate participants. Sometimes games require you to pay, so it's sometimes a cost benefit. What's more important to me? I think ads are fair because developers need to make money somehow. Um, so if they have a high passion for the game, a high gaming motivation, a really strong desire to play it, they have a higher acceptance for ads and they have a better understanding of the way uh, that monetization actually enables them to, uh, to continue playing their game. It's worth it because it's fair, like I'm selling my time to them. Um, but for new players, um, they may say something like, this is a direct quote from the new player, he said that ad just made me not like the game, do you want me to play your game or want me to watch your ad? Again, he has no passion, no motivation to play it, even though um, he may exist in the same motivational type, um, and it actually leads to more negative ad attitudes. Um, on top of that, poor advertising format and content can create a user's negative opinion of uh, the game itself. If your ads are tacky, developers, if you go to an ad network and your ads are tacky, um, your, your users are going to see that, and it's going to reflect poorly on your game. Um, so that kind of leads me to the last part of the talk, which is talking about the different ad formats and their, um, and their placement on game flow. And again, I'll be showing you these journeys. Um, so, if we look specifically here, um, when people lose the game and they have an option to watch a rewarded video, um, and then they hit play again, um, if they opt into the rewarded video, people feel a lot more positively. Um, this is largely because they have choice. The act of choosing and uh, exhibiting their own agency in a game on something that might actually benefit them uh, really you know, it speaks to people. Um, and so people are actually fairly positive about it before they resume their gameplay. But if we look at this interaction right here where people are initiating a new task flow, hitting play again or main menu before an automatic ad is played, um, people kind of get pissed. 
Um, so people who are very seasoned, who are passionate, will say, I'm usually so engrossed in playing the game that I hit play again. But when an ad comes up, they, uh, they think that it's a disruption. So when you're trying to go to menu and you think, OK, you click on menu and an ad pops up, I feel like I did something wrong. Um, but even though they perceive it as a disruption, as something interrupting their task flow, a lot of people have this more nuanced understand, or understanding, they have this nuanced gaming schema, where they say the ads are something I would definitely not want, but I guess that's how the platform system, system works. It's kind of integral. But I'd like to emphasize that um, this type of advertising uh, system is against Google's policy, and honestly, it's becoming a policy industry-wide. Um, so interstitials that launch unexpectedly, like when you're trying to initiate a new task flow, is just really bad practice. Um, Google is part of what is called the Coalition for Better Ads, which is in combination with a lot of companies, including Facebook and Apple. Um, we're, we're trying to create an industry-wide standard to make ads better, both for browsers and for, um, and for like mobile use. Um, so just in general, this is kind of an ad network thing. Don't surprise users with interstitials. But if we look at... If we look at this, um, if we look at sorry, that little dot down there with the automatic interstitial plays after initiating a new task flow, um, we can see that it's overall negative. Whereas the other form of ads were more tolerated, either more neutral or positive with rewarded videos, um, ads that pop up after initiating a new game-related task flow uh, really piss people off. Um, basically, the ad disrupts the momentum of the initiated task and breaks their motivation to continue playing. Um, and participants even say things like, "It's not always time that I get. Or, it's not always that I get to play a game. So if there's something stopping me, taking 10 seconds of my time, those 10 seconds feel so long that I stop playing the game or do something else." Um, so, oh yeah. So basically, um, having this interruption, um, something to take them out of the game, out of the immersive experience, which everybody talked about as being the most important thing, um, is incredibly uh, disruptive, and they they really don't like it. Um, but additionally, inconsisten inconsistencies in formatting of the ad also disrupts their game flow. Um, so with Google Ads, we have the X in the top right corner, but different games can, game developers can opt to have different ad networks show ads in your games. Sorry, that was weird. Um, but basically, different ad networks have different formatting, where the Xs sometimes take five seconds to pop up, it may be in the left corner, it may be in the right corner, and participants were really frustrated, um, no matter if they were seasoned, um, if they were new, or if, uh, or if it was seasoned players even with different ad types. Um, people were really frustrated when they couldn't find the X out button because it means they couldn't reinitiate their initial task flow. Um, so again, inconsistencies in formatting can disrupt the game flow. One way to do it, fix this is to uh, fix the inconsistencies to help players maintain their game flow because that's ultimately what people are there for. Okay, so we're going to try to summarize everything we just said in two slides. Um, basically, the rule of thumb is the more passionate the player, the wider variety of games they play. So if there's one thing that I could like sear into your synapses um, from my part of the talk today, it's this idea that the, hard, the more hardcore a player is, uh, at least in the mobile space, the evidence is very clear, it means they play more games and a more variety of games. They do not play exclusively hardcore uh, mobile titles. Um, and that if you are building games with more sophisticated players where you need more expertise um, in order to understand and enjoy the game, um, these people are also going to have a more nuanced way of thinking about is this ad worth it to me or not right now. Um, but what Pat's work has um, really highlighted is that this could be very game specific. So even though in general, across when I describe my mobile game play in general, I would be classified one way or another, in this specific game, depending on my relationship with the game, um, is the most important thing to understand if, if you're uh, thinking about a player's ad tolerance. Um, I'll give it to you. Um, so one way, one suggestion to increase ad engagement, um, whether that means like getting click-throughs or just more tolerance, is actually to have fewer or better ads up front so that people are not inundated with shitty ads that make them think that you're producing a shitty game. Um, so players, you basically want players to build an affinity for the game because the more, the more passionate they are about your game, the more motivated they are to play, and the more worth their time watching the ads becomes. And sometimes they'll even opt into rewarded videos, which can help you monetize. Um, money's not all that there is to the world, but it's nice. Um, 
One way to do this um, is to follow best practices. So if you're interested in looking at the best practices um, put forth by Google, then you can search AdMob banner ad guidance and interstitial or rewarded videos. That's it. Oh, there is, oh, here's it. <laughs> oh yeah, this is where, this is actually from the, from the Medium post um, that um, was, was one way that this global segmentation for mobile players was shared. Um, basically, um, what, what we'd like to empower people to do is to go back to their stakeholders and their game companies and actually be really clear about what are the, uh, what needs satisfaction the game is providing, what are the motivations that this game is supposed to scratch, and then use that to then build the strategy around, well, when do we want to place an ad? When is a good time to show them an ad? Um, how can we present an ad in a way that actually helps them achieve their goals, as opposed to frustrating their goals? And now that's the end, yes.